what do you think of when you hear standardized education? When I first read Engaging Minds, I was immediately thinking of standardized exams we did in high school and others like the CRNE, now NCLEX, um, in nursing, MCAT, LSAT, and the like. For some, standardized or core curriculum may come to mind, or even professional standards like the ones put out by professional organizations like the College of Nurses of Ontario. We're going to talk about some of these ideas and what they mean practically for teaching in this video. We're going to start off by talking about what a standardized classroom looks like. And then we're going to go into the nature of knowledge, learning, and learners, which I know is a bit theoretical and this is supposed to be a practical video, but it really sets the foundation for the practical stuff we want to talk about this week. We're also going to talk a bit about statistics and normal distributions. And then we're going to talk about planning to teach, focusing on learning styles, learning objectives, and Bloom's taxonomy. And then we're going to conclude by talking a little bit about assessment and evaluation within standardized education. So what does a standardized classroom look like? While it's really not difficult to find examples of standardized classrooms, many of the images that come up when you type in words like classroom, school, or teacher into a search engine like Google are examples of standardized classrooms. We also had a couple of videos posted in this module that gave some good examples. And with the video in, on classroom management in particular, I've had a few students email me asking, you know, was this guy joking? And, you know, I was waiting for the punchline or for him to say, haha, kidding. And, uh, asking me if he was serious. And yes, as far as I know, he was. A hallmark of standardized education is learners arranged in neat rows. And the teacher is off on the edge, or often in the front, so they can observe what's going on in their classroom. And this model of surveillance, by the way, is actually borrowed from prisons and asylums. There's often a standardized lesson plan that dictates what will be taught, as well as how and when this will be taught. And you may see some examples of trying to teacher-proof the curriculum by imposing structures to minimize variation between classrooms, schools, and school districts. For example, using the same textbook, standardized resources, or a common core curriculum that teachers follow. And here, control and order is very important. Classroom management often includes clear rules and clear consequences for breaking them. And this is really influenced by behaviorist theories with a focus on rewarding good behaviors and discouraging or punishing the bad ones. So before we move on, I have a few reflection questions for you to consider. So reflect on what classrooms have looked like across your educational experiences. What elements of standardized education did you experience? And as an educator, how might you deal with the physical constraints of a classroom that's set up for standardized education? And what about potential curriculum restraints? Knowledge, learning, and learners. So let's start off by talking a little bit about knowledge and knowing. And of course, if you want to hear more about this, please see my uh, previous video. Uh, so here within standardized education, knowledge is a commodity and it is a constructible object. So in short, knowledge is a thing. And here we're coming from an epistemological stance that believes in objective truths. And this is going to be really important when we get to our piece on assessment. So learning then is the process of acquiring this knowledge. And Davis talks about how here learning is the linear process of internalizing. In this frame, learning is seen to happen when something that starts on the outside of someone's head somehow comes to be manifest inside one's head. And this is known as correspondence theories of learning. So here with correspondence theories of learning, the learner is building a subjective internal mental model of the objective external world. And how well this matches or corresponds to this outward world, the more correct or accurate it is. And truth and correctness can be measured by comparing these subjective interpretations to the objective truths through evaluation. And what does this actually mean for learners? Well, here learners are consumers, or you can see them as sponges who are there to acquire or soak up knowledge. And we have a few assumptions about our learners here. So we're assuming that they're people who are deficient or incomplete, because remember in this moment, they're very much seen as being kind of on an assembly line in the factory that is schooling. And our learners are unique, but they can be understood in norms. And this idea of norms and normal is something I want to chat a bit about here, since this is really important for understanding assessment in standardized education. So with that, let's get statistical. So when we're talking about norms or a normal learner, we're talking about normal distributions. So for those of you who haven't taken your stats courses yet, um, just think bell curves. So this assumes that findings are evenly distributed around the mean or the average. And some key terms here are mean and standard deviation. So as I said, the mean is also known as the average, 
and it's the most common statistic that we use to measure the center of a numerical data set. And it's important to note that it's very sensitive to every number in the data set. So an issue with this means that the mean may not be a fair representation of our data because it can be influenced by outliers. So that would be an extreme on either end of the spectrum. So for example, in schooling, if one student gets a really, really high mark, it's going to drag up the class average. However, in a normal distribution, these high and low extremes balance each other out. And in a normal distribution, we get this nice bell-shaped curve that you can see on the right here. And this implies that the majority of the scores are lying around the center of distribution. And the standard deviation is the measurement that's used for the amount of variability or spread among the numbers in the data set. So it's the standard amount of deviation from the mean, or put simply, the typical amount of distance from the average. And standard deviations can also be used to describe where most of the data should fall if the data is normally distributed, and this allows us to make predictions and fit individuals into percentiles. And a really good example of percentiles is infant growth charts, which many of the healthcare professionals and parents in our class will be familiar with. As a side note, a critique of this within healthcare is that understanding that normal in this way can turn healthy people into patients. A further issue is that these statistics don't actually answer questions about the relevance or meaningfulness of the outcome, nor to whom the findings are actually important. Instead, it just tells that there is a statistically significant difference between groups. So with infant growth charts, for example, as a nurse I saw these charts causing a lot of completely unnecessary anxiety for parents. And the physician and I were far more concerned about the interaction of other factors that could influence the child's health, such as diet, exercise, socioeconomic class, genetics, medical history, and medications. So health and well-being is far more complex, but I'm going to table the rest of this rant for our module on systemic sustainability education. But for now, let's just talk a little bit more about how these predictions are done. So we do this by looking at the empirical rule. So here, approximately 68% of the total number of values will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. 90, about 95% of the values lie within two standard deviations of the mean, and approximately 99.7 lie within three standard deviations of the mean. And this is in cases where we have a normal distribution. And we do see some things that follow this pattern, although some mathematicians have argued that this sort of linear distribution isn't found in most phenomena in the population. And then we, as a society, initially applied this idea to manufactured products, assuming that objects produced in a factory will deviate from the desired standard in this predictable sort of way. Then we went on to apply this to birth rates, death rates, and then physical characteristics like height. So then something like a difference in height was no longer just seen as you know, natural diversity, but rather was seen in terms of error or deviation for what is quote-unquote normal. And then in the mid-1800s, we brought this idea over into psychology and sociology to look at mental qualities. And the idea of a normal learner comes from this adoption of statistics. Here researchers were trying to demonstrate that our ability to learn is normally distributed. And this standardized level of perfection, whether it be morally, physically, intellectually, was determined by the assumption of what a quote-unquote normal man was. And I'm not using man to refer to humankind, most research at this time was done on undergraduate men. And as a side note, uh, Woman's Ways of Knowing was a landmark feminist book that was published in the 1980s. At this time, women's perspectives still were absent from psychological research. When women were researched, it was a matter of how they conformed or diverged from the patterns that were found in studying men. And the authors in Women's Ways of Knowing argued that women have their own ways of knowing that may be different from those of men. Now, I do have a few issues with this book, as do others, but it is regardless a really important historical piece of work. Now, before we go on to talking about planning for teaching, I have a few questions for you to consider. First, what does this all mean for learners with exceptionalities, such as a learning disability? Who else may be excluded or marginalized by this understanding of normal students or normally distributed learning? And do you think normal distribution applies to learning? Now, let's move on to planning for teaching, which is where we're going to get far more practical, I promise. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to touch on was learning styles. Now, learning styles is something you've probably heard about before, and it did come up in our Getting to Know You survey, so it's something I wanted to debunk here. So proponents of learning styles claim that learners have a preference for a particular sensory modality of learning. So for example, visual learners need to see pictures, diagrams, or graphs to support their learning. Others may require more verbal explanations or having discussions. And others may claim that they learn best by reading on their own or by doing actual hands-on tasks. 
So these learning styles are often described as visual, verbal, auditory, and kinesthetic or hands-on, or I believe tactile is the word that Davis uses in engaging minds. And the idea here is that we need to consider these different learning styles when we're planning our lessons. And this idea is very entrenched within education. Um, there's one study that reports that as many of 90% of educators believe in this. So before I go on, uh, to take a moment to reflect on your own learning with regards to learning styles. Do you identify with any of these learning styles? And if so, was this a self-imposed categorization or did someone else like an educator label you this way? Now, despite learning styles being a popular concept, there's little evidence to support them. In fact, several large-scale literature reviews have failed to find empirical support for learning styles actually improving learning outcomes. And David Trumpower, a professor here at the Faculty of Education, published a really great article on this last fall in Education Review, which is our faculty's journal. And he talks about how we need to abandon this idea of learning styles. And it's an excellent read and I highly recommend it. I'll put a link to it uh, down below for you. So Dr. Trumpower gives us a few reasons for abandoning this concept of learning styles beyond the fact that there just isn't evidence for them. So first he talks about how labeling students can limit expectations about their learning potential. It can also provide ready-made excuses for students. So for example, saying that they don't get anything out of lectures because they're a kinesthetic learner. And second, some activities tailored to different learning styles may actually be more shallow learning experiences. They may not support deep, meaningful learning. For example, let's say I'm teaching an interprofessional team how to run a code blue. I have my visual learners watching a video on code blues, and I, my kinesthetic hands-on team is doing a simulation of a code blue. Who do you think is going to have a better learning experience, given that my goal is I want them to actually be able to run a code blue? And another risk here is they could miss the mark with regards to the actual learning objective. So if my learning objective is that learners should be able to participate in a code blue and half my class or the visual learners just watched a video, they're not going to meet this learning objective. Dr. Trumpower's third point is that providing so much redundant information in so many multiple modalities can create cognitive overload on the students. And as educators, it can also create overload on us because then we have to create so many activities and instructions. And his last point is that this non-critical adoption of learning styles, which as I said before, lacks really solid evidence, sets a really poor example for our students, particularly when we're teaching future educators in a class like this. Now, despite learning styles not really having any evidence to support them, there are meaningful differences between our learners that we should be taking into consideration in our teaching. As Dr. Trumpar says, we want to refocus on differences that matter. And he gives a few examples for us. First, we would want to consider differences in prior knowledge, interests, and motivations. You see some links here to adult learning theory. We also want to consider differences in metacognition, or students' ability to recognize their learning successes, areas for improvement, and developing effective learning strategies to support better self-regulated learning. An example of this is developing critical self-reflection skills, which is something we're working on in this course. We also want to consider differences in contexts and perspectives. So here as educators, rather than focusing all of our time on developing these different activities for different learning styles, our time may be better served coming up with multiple examples that take into consideration different contexts and perspectives. And finally, we want to consider differences in the to-be-learned content. So if we want our students to learn something about writing, we should probably do an activity about writing. If you're talking about art, we may want to show them pictures of art. And if they're learning CPR, get them to practice CPR. To me, this is really about having consistency between our learning objectives, our teaching strategies, and our assessment methods. And this brings us to planning to teach. So we're going to start off by talking about how Davis talks about planning to teach and engaging minds, and then we're going to talk a little bit about an instructional design article. So Davis talks about how, within standardized education, teaching occurs in self-contained chunks or lessons. And here, lesson plans are often used to outline what will be taught. So a standardized lesson plan template will often include learning objectives, which should be observable and measurable, and often these are pulled from mandated curriculum guides. Uh, it should include direct instruction or the actual teaching, such as a lecture, an appropriate practice exercise for your students, and an evaluation strategy, and this needs to be related to those pre-stated learning objectives. And this is why you want your learning objectives to be observable and measurable. A critique of using standardized lesson plans is that it can be quite rigid and mechanistic. Also, how does the teacher deviate from the lesson plan if needed, given that the lesson may be allocated to specific blocks of time? 
although within this moment, one may argue that a well-planned lesson won't deviate from the plan. Now let's talk a little bit about instructional design. And I have a longer video talking about this in Bloom's Taxonomy, which we'll get into in a moment, uh, available on my YouTube, which I will link here. This article on instructional design is a really great introduction to writing your learning objectives and just generally planning to teach. The authors highlight that learning objectives are really important because they let the students know what's expected of them. And like Davis said, they're also important to picking our assessment methods and also deciding what we're going to teach or the content and how we're going to teach it, our teaching strategies. And a really great guide for writing our learning objectives is the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, more commonly known as Bloom's Taxonomy. And this is a framework for classifying statements of what we expect or intend students to learn as a result of our instruction. And here there's really two parts to writing your learning objective. So there's the noun or the content and the verb. And these represent two different dimensions, the knowledge dimension and the cognitive process dimension. So some types of knowledge include factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge, and metacognitive knowledge. And the cognitive process dimension is what I think most people think of when they think about Bloom's taxonomy, because it's what's in the pyramid diagram that we associate with this. So there's six categories here. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. Note that there is a previous version of this. So if you see different names on the pyramid, you're looking at the older version. This is the updated version from 2001. And these go from more simple to more complex or abstract. Although the newer version isn't as strict as the hierarchy as the original 1956 version. Now we can apply these principles to our learning objectives. And then we can use these learning objectives to pick appropriate teaching strategies and assessment strategies. Specifically, we can do this by looking at the type of knowledge we want to teach, or the noun, and the cognitive process dimension. And here we want to make sure our teaching strategy and assessment strategy will be appropriate for this learning objective. So if our objective is for students to demonstrate the administration of an injection, just giving a lecture and then assessing them with a written quiz is just not going to cut it. So there needs to be consistency between that learning objective, teaching strategy, and assessment method. And it's important to note here that you may use assessment strategies from outside of standardized education. What's really rooted in standardized education here is Bloom's taxonomy because taxonomies are very much associated with standardized education. So a few questions for reflection before we get into that assessment piece. How do you feel about learning styles now? Do you have any additional critiques of them? And if so, what? Are there additional meaningful differences amongst learners that you think we should focus on as educators? And how might you apply Bloom's taxonomy to your own teaching? Now let's talk a little bit about assessment and evaluation here. Assessment and evaluation are not unique to this moment, nor is testing unique to this moment. However, what's unique here is how testing and evaluation often get conflated in standardized education. So what is assessment in standardized education? Well, we can understand this by going back to our talk about theory and epistemology. So remember, in standardized education, we're talking about there being truths out there and this ideal realm that we can reach through mental discipline. So that idea of an objective truth is really important here when we're understanding assessment. And correspondence theories of learning really help to elaborate on this. The idea of our subjective interpretations corresponding to this external objective world. So we can understand assessment in standardized education as measuring how well, i.e. accurately, correctly, the learner's internal subjective interpretation matches or corresponds to that objective external world or truths. So I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of different types of grading that's influenced by standardized education. Norms-based grading, or grading on a curve as you've probably heard it called, and criterion-based grading, specifically rubrics. Now, while these approaches are quite different, they are still rooted in the same sort of industry-inspired grading and scoring. So like when we talk about different qualities of meat, like grade A beef, we're scoring the quality of a product. Interestingly, a 2016 study found that faculty who were more research-oriented are more likely to grade on a curve, while those who are more teaching-oriented tend to use more criterion-based grading. Kind of an interesting fact to keep in mind as we uh, go through these two examples. So let's start off with norms-based grading. So I haven't experienced this one too much as a learner. I think my anatomy course in nursing school may have done this, but it was so long ago that I don't really remember. Now, norms-based grading involves comparing students to one another based on the assumption that learners are normally distributed. And this is why we got statistical earlier in this presentation. 
So IQ tests technically also fit under this category. And in classes, it can be grading on a curve where the desired grade distribution is predetermined and the grades are curved to fit this normal distribution. So for example, only 20% of the class can get an A and the grade average will be a C. Thus, the grades are very dependent on what has been selected as the norm. And this is really meant to safeguard grading standards across classes. Not surprisingly, I have a few critiques of this approach and I am not the only one. For starters, this doesn't say anything about what was actually learned, just where the student sits on the curve relative to others. So the focus here is on outperforming others rather than learning. So it's really more of an academic hunger games than being about learning. Also, the so-called smart kids really don't have to work as hard and do their best. They just need to do enough to outperform others. And students who aren't doing as well may be less incentivized because they feel that they're at a competitive disadvantage. Second, this approach creates competition between students and could decrease cooperation because students may cease to see each other as a positive influence on their learning. Like I said, academic hunger games. This is extremely problematic for anyone whose teaching philosophy values social interaction and collectives, such as those of you who feel more inclined towards social constructivism, communities of practice, even complexity science. And furthermore, as someone whose teaching philosophy is influenced by complexity science, I just don't believe my learners are normally distributed. I believe my learners are complex adaptive systems who are situated within micro and macro systems. And complex adaptive systems, as we'll discuss in module five, are by definition non-linear. And their non-linear interactions give rise to complex behaviors, which makes it extremely difficult, if not entirely impossible, to make accurate predictions. And just how these sorts of normal distributions can turn healthy people into patients, I worry it can do the same for my students. Rubrics are a type of standards-based or criterion-based grading systems. Um, there's a few different types of rubrics. For example, in our class, we're using holistic rubrics and analytic rubrics. And while there's certainly pros and cons to them, like any other assessment strategy, I do really like using them. An advantage of them is that the expectations are very clearly stated up front. Students can also use these to self-assess their own work. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. And rubrics also look at individual performance, not collective ranking. So it's about your performance as a student and not how well or how poorly other students performed. Although I guess you could technically use a criterion-based grading system and then grade it on a curve. Alrighty, and that's all for now, folks. I hope this video helped you see some of the more practical applications of standardized education, as well as giving you a few tools that you can start applying to your teaching. I tried to take some ideas that you're gonna see some of your other courses, particularly with regard to the teaching strategies and assessment, so hopefully this is a nice little primer for those of you who do take those courses. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments, and as always, I will see you all online.